Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Talent Summit. My name is Ann Hutchison and I am the President and CEO of the Fort Collins Area Chamber. On behalf of our organization, I am thrilled to have you join us from your home, office, or mobile device. We've got a great program planned today, and we appreciate you making the time to join us in this important conversation about the future of your workforce. We invite you to get involved today via social media by using the hashtag work in Northern Colorado. Again, that hashtag is work Colorado. We also want to make sure we spend a little bit of time thanking the people that have made this event possible. We have a number of amazing, amazing sponsors. They've stuck with us through these new formats, ideas, and concepts, and we certainly couldn't do it without them. So a very special thank you to our gold sponsors, the City of Fort Collins and HP Inc., our silver sponsors, Biz West Media and Columbine Health Systems, our bronze sponsors, Elevations Credit Union, Mad Wire, Northern Engineering, Robert Half, and UC Health, and our event sponsors, Canvas Credit Union, North 40 News, and Sinorama. Thank you all. Finding and keeping key talent will continue to be a critical mission for employers throughout the Northern Colorado region, made even more complicated with the pandemic and challenging trends and laws. We hope that this event will provide an opportunity for you to gain new insights, resources, and tools that you can use to create your future workforce. This initiative is certainly not possible without key regional partners coming together with the same goals. We want to say a very special thank you to our talent partners, the City of Fort Collins, the City of Loveland, Larimer County, Larimer County Economic and Workforce Development, Loveland Chamber of Commerce, One NOCO, United Way of Larimer County, and the Cities of Greeley and the Greeley Area Chamber. Before we begin to hear from our powerful lineup of speakers, let's see who's joining us today for this event. We've got a, a great new tool that's available on your CVent platform that lets us do some polling. So you'll see that polling icon on the right hand of your screen. And um, this poll will be live throughout the event. So keep an eye on it so that we can have uh, some fun conversations. So let's start out with our very first set of questions today. Um, and number one is, how are you feeling today? Possible answers include, Still in my PJs, just rolled out of bed. Second option is I need a second cup of coffee. Your third option is I've already been to the gym, I'm ready to go. And the fourth option is other. Go ahead and input your reaction to that poll right now. And again, we'll see the results right on the screen. So this is new technology for us. We're still waiting to see if we've got some results. All right, so it looks like 40% of you have already been to the gym. Good job. Uh, you're, much, you're much better morning people than I am. Uh, if I wasn't here on screen with you today, I might still be in my PJs. All right. Uh, let's move on to our second question today. So um, we would love to know why you are attending the Talent Summit. Is it for education, for resources, for insights, the speaker lineup, or other? Go ahead. And again, it's right there on your platform. Don't need to dial out to any other site. You can just click and share. Outstanding. It looks like 50% of you are super interested in the insights we have to share today, and 24% of you are looking for some great educational opportunities. We'll do one more poll just to test it out, and here we go. Final question is, where are you joining us from? Option number one, your office. Option number two, your home slash garage slash patio. Option number three, a coffee shop. 
Option number four, your car, or option number five, other. And waiting just a moment for those final results. All right, it looks like 68% of you are from your home, your garage, or patio. And another 36% of you are at the office. Um, fairly interesting data point, I think, as we began our conversation with Andrea a little later today about work from home and, and what the transition might look like. So thank you all so much for participating in our polling today. We appreciate it. Again, we'll be throwing out some questions throughout the morning. So keep an eye on that box. Make sure you share your input and, um, and join us in the conversation. We want to jump right into our programming today. Again, we've got an amazing, amazing lineup. And um, to kick us off, we're going to hear from one of our key sponsors, the City of Fort Collins. The City of Fort Collins is delighted to be a sponsor of this year's Talent Summit. At the City, we believe in the power of our people and our organization to deliver exceptional service for an exceptional community. Our ability to deliver 24-7, 365 services begins and ends with our talent. For a local government to be great, who you hire and retain is critical. People may not realize that the City of Fort Collins is one of Larimer County's largest employers, as we have over 2,000 employees serving our community. In March 2020, we asked ourselves, what story do we want told when the pandemic is over? We said our overarching goal was to preserve the public trust in our ability to meet the community's needs by retaining an adaptive, competitive, and diverse workforce while upholding our commitment to being good financial stewards. One of our guiding principles was to be a model in the community as the fifth largest employer in the county by our leadership action in retaining talent now and post recovery. I welcome learning from our speakers today as we consider talent and the future of work. And I hope you see the city as a participant in attracting talent to serve the community, a partner in the region and a platform that enables employers of all sizes to succeed. We are in this together. Good morning, my name is Karen Burke and I'm the Director of Human Resources for the City of Fort Collins and it is my distinct honor to be here this morning and I am more than thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Andrea Alexander is the Associate Partner at McKinsey & Company's Houston office and a leader in the organizational practice. She specializes in transforming large institutions to deliver lasting performance improvements and has significant expertise in many people-related topics, including organizational design, culture, leadership, team effectiveness, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Andrea is leading McKinsey's thinking on reimagining the post-pandemic workforce and currently spends the majority of her time counseling senior leaders as they rethink the way their workforce interacts and engages as a result of the trends that have been accelerated due to the pandemic. Prior to joining McKinsey and Company, Andrea taught high school math for Teach for America and helped run a charter school in Harlem, New York. Um, Andrea has a master's from a small university you may have heard of, Harvard. And Andrea is a new shero of mine. Andrea has a hectic life. She is a, the mother of three young girls. She reminds her husband that he's lucky, lucky to be surrounded by her fun, strong-willed women. She also enjoys running marathons in her very limited free time. Again, Andrea, we are thrilled to have you, and you are one of my new sheroes. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, that was such a, such a great introduction. Um, I do love running marathons. It is the way that I just kind of get to decompress at the end of the day, so or beginning of the day. I am definitely a morning person. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So we are here to talk about the post-pandemic workforce. And as Karen said, I am leading the thinking for McKinsey on this topic. And it's not because this is something that I've been focused on for the last 10 years, but really about a year ago, I was asked to help a tech client 
think about how to bring people back to the workforce, as to, back to the office as soon as possible. And after about a week or two trying to solve that problem, we quickly realized that's probably the wrong question to be answering. And instead we should be asking ourselves, do we need people to come back to the office? And if so, for what activities? And that really started a, um, an effort that has then impacted thousands of companies across the globe and really excited to talk to you guys about it today. What I share with you today is not just my perspective. It is driven by over a hundred conversations I've had with C-suite executives. It's also driven by a lot of the work that McKinsey has done across the globe and in various industries on the topic, as well as surveys and articles that have been published both by McKinsey and others. So I know that you really are getting kind of all of this wrapped in one with some, with five key pitfalls to avoid when it comes to reimagining your post-pandemic workforce. And what I'll do is I'll highlight these five pitfalls and then go into more detail about each one after, the, after I give the overview. So first, the first pitfall that you wanna avoid is assuming that recent success will translate into post-pandemic success. So just because we've been successful for the last year working virtually, that doesn't mean that you can just assume you're gonna be successful long-term without being more intentional. You also um, want to avoid the pitfall of waiting to communicate until you have perfect clarity on what the post-pandemic workforce and workplace will look like. People wanna know now what their future may entail, and they're totally open to it evolving over time, but the more information you can provide today, the better. You also do not want to develop a one-size-fits-all solution. The type of work that we all do is different. And so it's important to make sure that you are creating a way of working that works for the different teams and people that you have within your organization. You also want to make sure that you are not allowing ultimate flexibility at the employee and manager level. People have different preferences, and so you have to provide some guide rails to make sure that what you have and, and the new ways of working is cohesive across the entire organization. And then lastly, there are real financial benefits from having a more virtual or hybrid virtual workforce where some of the work is getting done outside of the traditional office. But if you focus solely on financial savings, then your, the benefits of the work of the new working model will be short-lived. So some more details about this first one. We all know that the past year has been more successful than most thought. We very quickly moved a lot of individuals who were primarily working from the office to be primarily, if not 100% virtual for the last, for over the last year. And what you see here is that pre-COVID, you did have more people that were working fully on site. And now because of the success, the hope after COVID is much different. You have more than half of employees that are saying, I actually really want a hybrid model where I'm in the office sometimes and I'm virtual sometimes. You also have slightly more people that are saying, I wanna be fully remote. And at the same time, you have some people that are saying they wanna be fully on site. What you wanna be thoughtful about here though is, we have been successful for the last year. If you look at the productivity and the perceived productivity of employees, they will say, I've been able to get my work done. But a key reason why we've been, we've been so productive over the last year is the fact that before that we were in person for years or decades, and we had a way of working that was established. We had culture and social cohesion and trust with one another that we've really been using to ensure that we've been, to help fuel, fuel our success going forward. As the longer that we are virtual, that is going to erode. And if you're not intentional about how do we create touch points to build more trust and social cohesion going forward, then what you'll see is that um, the connections that you have within the organization are going to erode and people will no longer know who to connect with, who to collaborate with, and you will not be as successful long-term. It's also really important to note that being primarily on site or being primarily virtual is very different than a hybrid model, which is where most organizations are going. So most organizations are saying, I'm not gonna go back to the old normal. 
where most people are on site five days a week. But I'm also not going to go, not going to keep the model that we have today where no one's in the office or very few people are in the office. Instead, it's going to be something in the middle. And when you have that, that model in the middle, there's a lot that can happen in terms of some people are on site on any given day, some people are working virtual. And so you need to be very thoughtful about what norms and practices you have that will allow people to remain successful, whether they're working from the traditional office or their home. It's also really important to note that 29% of employees are saying that they would consider switching employers if they were required to go back to a traditional fully on-site model. And so as companies are thinking about what the future looks like, that needs to be really top of mind. The next pitfall I'll talk about is avoiding communicating a plan until you have perfect clarity. Sometimes you have leadership teams or managers that say, I want to make sure I know exactly what this is going to look like before I commu communicate anything to others. And what we've seen is that only 32% of employers have well communicated what the future is going to look like. 28% have vaguely communicated it, but 40% have not communicated anything at all or very little. And what that, what that means is the implication of that is that you actually see that 46% of people that didn't receive um, good communication about what that future state working model will look like actually have real concern and anxiety around it. And so there's a need to make sure that we are communicating the plan, what we know about the plan. So if you don't have a total plan detailed out and you can't tell every person how often they need to be in the office or not, at least communicate what you know, the philosophy that you have. So that as, as people are making life choices, they're able to have an understanding of what the work model with expectations are gonna be in terms of being in person. What this sometimes can look like is, you know, we expect people to be in person two days a week. Those two days will be coordinated because we wanna make sure people are in the office at the same time, but we haven't yet figured that out specifically. And there will be some flexibility there. That is more communication than many organizations have done. And that will ease some of the anxiety that employees are feeling. You also want to make sure that you're taking the time now to put the thinking together about what that future state will look like. The fact that more companies have not communicated this is really driven by the fact that they don't know what the model is yet. It's not that they're not telling employees, it's that they actually just don't know what the model will be. So take the time, put the, put the team together, the task force together to think through this and make sure that when you do communicate, you, commu you communicate something that says, we're gonna continue to evolve this over time because this is a new model for most organizations. And it's one that we are still learning together what will work and what will not work. And then lastly, when it comes to communication, it's important to make sure that you have two-way communication. So you wanna be able to communicate to your employees, but you also wanna make sure that employees are able to communicate back what they like, what they don't like, what their wishes are as well. So make sure that that is part of your communication plan. So I've talked a lot about the need to have a model and to put that task force together. And when you put that task force together, that's gonna decide what the new way of working is when it comes to a more hybrid model. You wanna remember not to develop a one size fits all solution. It's important to make sure that the model that you choose is one that works for the different types of employees that you have in an organization. And so everyone does not need to be on the exact same schedule, but it should be based off of the type of work that they do. So here on the spectrum, what you see is from on-site, fully on-site, where there's just some activities that are what we would refer to as on-site critical. You need to be at the office location in order to actually get the work done. This is often a lot of manufacturing type work. And then you have the other spectrum that is, you know, virtual or mostly virtual, where you really don't need to come on site that often. Most companies, as I mentioned, are going to fall in the middle, which is hybrid, but there's a lot of different models of hybrid. So you can be in person first where you're on site three or four days a week. 
Um, or it could be where you're on site only one to two days a week. And it's really based off of some weekly meetings that you have, and you're going to schedule those around certain days so that when you're on site, you're doing much more collaboration and connecting with people as opposed to your independent work. There's also a model within that hybrid approach that's more virtual first, where you say, we're gonna be really intentional about when we want people to come on site based off of the type of work that they do. So some organizations would say, you know, we have a finance department and we can always get our work done virtually. We don't necessarily need to be in person, but if we are gonna be in person because we wanna make sure that we have some um, maintain our culture and connectivity, then we're gonna do it as we're closing the books each month, right? Because that's when we need to interact more with one another than other, other times of the month. And so they might be on site one week out of the month, whereas you have um, your HR manager, for example, who's gonna be on site one or two days a week so that they can schedule important meetings that need to be face-to-face -face during that time. At the end of the day, you wanna understand the spectrum of options that you have when designing your future state workforce and work, way of working. Um, and you wanna select a couple of them that you'll then be able to choose for different individuals and teams. And it's really important to make sure that this is not just an individual view, but a team view. Because when people come into the office, they wanna make sure that they're able to interact with the team that they're working with. Now, Part of the reason why we are um, attempting to go more virtual long-term is because of the flexibility that it provides. The number one request of men and women alike pre-pandemic was more flexibility. They've now all tasted, most of them, have tasted more of that flexibility and proven that they can be productive while working from various locations. Despite that, you want to refrain from allowing ultimate flexibility at the employee and manager level. More flexibility is great. More flexibility around where you work and when you work and the hours, that's great. But if you let every individual employee and manager make those decisions for him or herself, then what will happen is you'll have certain people showing up into the office and the others that they wanna interact with will not be there. If you leave it up to the managers, you'll have managers that have a personal bias or preference to be on site um, that are mandating that their employees come on site as well. And so you'll have different cultures kind of bubbling up within the organization. And so instead, what you wanna do is make sure that you are really thoughtful about what are the moments that matter, right? What are the um, guide rails or guidelines that you're going to provide your organization about when we need to be co-located together? And then make sure that you're taking into account the different team and individual interactions so that you're solving for not only individual productivity, which is often much higher when people are working separately, but also team productivity. And it's important to note that the preferences of your employees and managers are not things that you can predict based off of whether they're a baby boomer or a millennial um, or Gen Z. As you can see from this chart here, the preferences really do vary for each um, demographic. And so it's important to be aware of that also from a change management point of view where you are not going to choose a model that is the preference for everyone. And so how do you make sure that you are bringing everyone along and people feel like they um, are still getting the level of flexibility that they want? It's, it's tough, but it's, it's, a, it's a problem that's worth taking the time to solve. Now, we also wanna make sure that we are not focusing solely on financial savings. I will acknowledge there are real financial savings if you have a more virtual workforce. You, we are already seeing trends for a reduction in the amount of main office space that people are, that organizations um, have. We also see satellite offices decreasing because at the end of the day, work from home is increasing so much. And if there are opportunities to save on your geographical footprint, that's great. We encourage you to do that. However, you wanna make sure that you are cognizant of the risks and really thoughtful about them. If you 
orient too much on reducing your geographic footprint, then you may end up with not enough space for the types of interactions that you want. You also wanna make sure that it's not just about the square foot, but also the design of the space that you have. Do we want more open floor layouts? Do we want more conference rooms? Because when people come in, they're gonna be working in teams. That's a lot of the analysis and observations that you wanna do now. One company that I worked with actually started piloting with teams. So they, during this time of COVID where we're not able to have everybody back into the office, but they can have a low density population or less, less fewer people in the office. Um, what, what you actually see is they had teams raise their hand and say, you know, our team has said we're gonna come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and really figure out what activities should happen in person versus virtual. And when you observe how they're using the space, one insight that we found was that we actually still need the small offices because you have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations that are kind of the difficult conversations, coaching, feedback, that you want to be able to close the door to, to have those private conversations. And so that really influenced the, the layout that this company is thinking about going forward. You also want to make sure that as you're thinking about these financial savings, how much, what are you going to reinvest? This new way of working requires managers to show up very differently. The role of the manager has an outsized importance on the experience of employees. And so if you are not investing in the training of your team leaders who are now trying to figure out how to manage teams that are partially in person and partially virtual at any point in time, then you're gonna, the, then there's gonna be some negative impact if you're not investing there. So you wanna make sure that you're adequately preparing your team leads. You also just want to be mindful of as you're down, as you're decreasing your workspace, if you decide to do that, that you make sure that you don't have two different cultures emerging. So one for those that are on site and one for those that are virtual. So how do you make sure that those connections maintain um, going forward? So I've talked a lot today already. The five pitfalls, just as a reminder, because I know that you will not fall into any of these traps. First, do not assume that the recent success we've all had working virtually will translate to post-pandemic success, especially as we are moving to a hybrid model, which is much more challenging to implement effectively than the one where we're primarily on-site or primarily virtual. Also, don't wait to communicate. Employees want to know the direction the company plans to go with their future state working model. And so this means communicate what you know as soon as you know it, let people know that you're going to continue to learn over time, but also make sure that you've put the team together that's going to do the thinking for what the future state model will look like. Don't develop a one size fits all solution. Be really thoughtful about the type of work that your individuals and teams are doing and design accordingly. Don't um, in, embrace flexibility, but embrace flexibility that is consistent across the organization. And so don't leave it up to every employee or manager to decide what the model is. Give guide rails, give guidance so that there's a similar decision criteria that's made throughout the organization. And lastly, realize your financial savings, but don't focus solely on them. You want to make sure that you are reinvesting where it's necessary and ensuring that the trust and social cohesion and the connections that you have today are maintained through the future. I hope you guys have a lot of questions. I love answering questions and making sure that the guidance that I'm sharing is what's really on your mind. So would love to hear if you have questions and I'm excited to answer them. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was really fantastic information. Uh, do want to remind our participants that there's an opportunity for you to send questions into us. That's located on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, you can you can enter those questions into the Q and A, and and we'll get them forwarded over here to Andrea. Um, I am blown away by this conversation about hybrid work, Andrea. And um, as we're evolving back to the office. Your data point about 29% of the workforce is saying that they would leave an organization if they were, this is my word, forced to return to a traditional setting. 
um, hybrid or, or virtual, is that important to them? Can you dive a little bit deeper on that, on that data point and um, some suggestions for employers as they're trying to balance out this need for getting work done in the building and, um, and, and what you might be able to do otherwise? Yeah. A, little, a little deeper there? Absolutely. So that 20, 29%, that's a big number, right? And that is um, important for organizations to realize. This is not a new phenomenon. Employees pre-pandemic have been asking for more flexibility. And now that they've tried it and proven that they can be effective, there's really a desire or kind of a demand of, this is what I want going forward. But what we're also seeing is that people still do miss the connections. They just don't want them five days a week, you know, from the morning all the way through the evening. And so companies really need to listen to their employees. If you haven't already, survey your own employee base and understand from them, what are you appreciating about this additional flexibility that we have? What are your expectations or desires for the future? And then also what's not working for you today, right? So getting that information so that you can make an, a more informed decision around what the plan will be for you um, and your organization going forward is important. So I would say the survey, Two, I would say, make sure that you are embracing a kind of pilot and learn approach. At the end of the day, no one knows what this is going to look like. And so we want to be able to say we're going to continue to learn from one another. Thank you. Um, we're starting to get some questions in the Q&A, but let me throw one more at you before we jump over to these submitted by our attendees. And that's relative to this communication piece. Um, again, I, I was shocked by the numbers, right? 46% of our workforce is anxious because they've not been given really strong direction or communication about what's next. I think as employers, we regularly wanna make sure we have all of our ducks in a row, we know exactly what's going to happen. Can you share some um, additional guidance for those of us that sit in that employer seat on, on, on that balancing act between having the information just right, which we've all been trained to do, and um, sharing at least a, a sneak peek to, to help to allay some fears? Talk, talk a little more about that. Absolutely. What we've started to see during this pandemic is even more communication between leaders and employees. You're seeing much more fre frequent virtual town halls where leaders are just sharing what we know today. And that's the type of communication that needs to continue going forward. People are anxious. People are wondering if they can move to different states and still continue to do their job. And so the more that you can provide, the more clarity, the better. But that also means taking the time to actually get some answers so that you have something to communicate. So do that now and then communicate as much as you can, as quickly as you can, but let people know that it will evolve. Thank you. So here's a question from one of our attendees um, wondering about um, specific perks or things that you would recommend doing on site to encourage people to come into the office more often, even though we might be leaning hard on a hybrid model suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. So when people come into the office, they want to connect. If you go into the office and you are sitting behind your computer all day on calls, you will then most likely say, why did I come into the office today? And so what you need to do is what we honestly, what we all need to do is, okay, what are these moments that we're going to have in person? Are we going to have, um, uh, lunches where you are almost encouraging people to interact with people, not only on their team, but others. Are there happy hour type events? Are there speakers that you're bringing where it's not a speaker where everybody could have just been sitting behind the computer, but there's a speaker. And then after the speaker um, finishes their address, you have small groups that talk about the implications of what they just heard. So really thinking through how can we get people together to interact and connect as opposed to sit in a conference room or sit and listen to a um, CEO speak, but not have any interaction really with other people. Great. Um, so we're getting great feedback in the Q and a uh, people are very appreciative of what you're sharing today, Andrea. Um, here, here's another question for, from our audience. Any insights on engaging customers and organization serves? 
um, how do we get customers to help us through this transition space and, and, and be continue to be supportive? Yeah. I mean, customers are all experiencing the same thing as well. Right. And so I think being as open and transparent with your customers is important and bringing them into the dialogue as well to understand what it, what, what experience they're having as your model changes. I think that open dialogue is important and really considering the impact of your choices on them is key. Great. Another question from our audience. Um, some workplaces have employees that cannot work from home or in a hybrid model. How can an organization ensure a sense of equity with those employers when their coworkers are enjoying flexibility? Tough yeah, one. It, it is a tough one. And also, if you look at the demographic of those critical on-site employees, they tend to be um, more professionals of color um, in general. And so it is definitely a question of equity and sometimes racial equity at the same time. What you have some organizations doing is they're saying, you know, we have a segment of the population that can work virtually literally 100% of the time and still be effective. But because we also have a large portion of the workforce that given the work that they do are unable to have that same flexibility, we are not going to embrace the full flexibility that we could of the other workforce. So you're kind of coming down in the middle because you want there to be one culture. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you also need to be thoughtful about, okay, flexibility is still a desire for everyone. So even though it may not be working from home on a consist consistent basis, how can you redesign the work in a way where you're still giving them some benefit? It's a challenge that I would say no one's necessarily cracked yet, but it's important to really test and continue to see what works. Great. Uh, final question here for you, Andrea. Um, has McKinsey or others considered the serious long-term risk of this massive social experiment of increasing isolation by requiring remote work? Um, talk a little bit about maybe the space that McKinsey's in relative to, to understanding the impact that we've made on our, our workforce, but as well, how do, how do we come out of this? Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. One is it, there's, there's often a question that's asked around, well, if people want to be in the office, can we just let them come into the office, right? Like, and make it optional instead of requiring people to work from home. Let people come into the office five days a week. They will be the ones that are um, considered for promotions, considered for those great opportunities because of recency bias, right? You'll see them in the hallway and it'll just, it'll just happen. And so you have to be really thoughtful about that. No one knows at this point, though, what working the long term implications of working from home. And so it's important to make sure that you are putting in place metrics to monitor the impact of it, really pulling your employees. And then also, I like to recommend doing a social network analysis to understand how mm. connected the organization is and refreshing that, whether it's quarterly or twice a year. Um, but understanding the connections, whether people are feeling less connected to one another is key. Outstanding. Thank you, Andrea, so much for setting the stage for our conversation today. I completely appreciate the work that McKinsey does, the work that you do, and the fact that you made time in, in your incredibly busy schedule to join us. Um, the great news is via Zoom, we could have Andrea come and join us from Austin uh, at a click's notice, but uh, certainly we would love to invite you to come to Northern Colorado sometime soon. And again, thank you for your, your fantastic work and for the insights that you shared today. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. This has been so much fun. I love it. And those were great questions. So thank you all. Outstanding. So from here, we are going to transition into what we're calling a showcase. Uh, we have the opportunity today to do some storytelling about some interesting things that many of our employers are doing throughout Northern Colorado. And our first showcase today is JBS and features Phil DeVecchio. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here with you today. My name is Phil Del Vecchio, and I'm the head of culture and talent with JBS Foods. Uh, JBS is a global food company, and we employ 250,000 team members across the world. And I'm just happy to be here with you today to talk about building culture and community 
and to discuss a little bit about our COVID-19 response. First and foremost, on any presentation we ever do, we talk about our values, our mission, and our beliefs. This really defines our culture. Um, so feel free to dig into this. I know you guys will have access to the slides and read through each one of these, but ultimately we wanna be the best in all that we do through the various aspects of our business, uh, providing opportunities for our team members. Um, so just continuing to move forward here, uh, global outlook, you know, we have locations all across the globe and 51% uh, of our revenue is really driven through the United States. So we have a headquarters in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but also Greeley, Colorado. And uh, that's where we do a lot of our revenue, a lot of our business through the United States. Um, the way we look at it also is we have a lot to, a lot of challenge ahead of us because of the exponential population growth on this planet. We're gonna be needing to feed 2.8 billion more individuals over the next 20 to 30 years. So when we look at that, it presents this challenge and we, we create initiatives and priorities to really meet that challenge. Um, really number one, we're focused on our people and our talent management. We, we're focused on our company culture as well, as you can see a high performance mindset. Um, operational excellence is key, making sure our processes are in place. We have an efficient and safe process in all of our facilities. Um, and that we're focused on the consumer and the customer and how we approach those folks. And then also always trying to continuously innovate and bring new technologies to our world. Um, we also have some key talent and culture and leadership programs in place um, that really take care of our culture in a lot of ways. Um, and so there's a strategy in place there. Um, but I wanna talk more about really when COVID-19 hit, what was our response? Um, I'm really proud to announce or say that, that our CEO in early March announced, um, hey guys, we're gonna, we're gonna shift our focus from KPIs, sales numbers and metrics um, to these top three priorities. And really it's around team member safety and ensuring that we are safe in our facilities, um, but also recognizing and embracing the responsibility to provide quality food for the, the United States, but also the broader world. Critical food industries, um, stayed open. Um, and so we were one of them and we needed to stay open and provide that service for the country. And then number three was just to continue to provide job opportunities for all of our team members all, along with the benefits that come with that. Um, so proud, proud of those three key initiatives. But on top of that, our focus really started being driven towards um, what that meant. What that meant was keeping our team members safe by increasing health and safety measures. We had a $200 million investment into that. We also increased the amount of hourly wages and bonuses for our team members. And we've since been doing surveillance testing for COVID-19, ensuring that our uh, facilities are, are safe there in that way. And then we're also doing all of these vaccinations. Right now we're over 30,000 team members vaccinated through our programs. Along with the bullet points here listed on the slide, you can dig into at a later point, um, but we have, uh, more in terms of morale boosting uh, measures that we took. So things like billboards and thank you cards and um, uh, coaching conversations, one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations with leaders who were struggling with their teams through the pandemic. So really just providing support um, to our team members and making sure morale was high. Um, a really cool program that came out of all of this was we realized we were giving a lot of attention to our individual team members. Um, why not the broader communities within uh, which we work and live. And so we created the Hometown Strong Initiative, which is a $50 million initiative to give back to the communities um, that we're living in. Uh, and then moving forward, you guys, we're gonna do everything that I just mentioned and continue to provide um, those services and, and those interventions um, that we created throughout 2020. We're gonna move through 2021 and create a Better Futures program, which is offering uh, college assistance and, uh, and technical college assistance um, for tuition for all of our team members and their dependents. Um, so continuing to give back in that way. Uh, and then one more plug for these culture programs, we're going to, going to continue to build out our world-class talent and development programs to really drive culture for our team members. So a lot to pack in there, you guys. Thanks for bearing with me. If you have any follow-up thoughts, questions, or concerns, Feel, feel free to reach out to me, phil.delvecchio at jbssa.com. And have a great rest of the program. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Phil and JBS, for your commitment to Northern Colorado. It was great to have the opportunity to showcase you with our larger audience.
We're going to move right along with our agenda today, and I am thrilled to introduce to you Karen Policastro. Uh, she is with Robert Half and is going to talk a little bit about um, demand for skilled talent, something that I know all of us face throughout Northern Colorado. So let's turn it over to Karen. Awesome. Thank you so much, and what a great program, and, and good morning, Northern Colorado. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to spend a bit of time with you this morning. Again, my name is Karen Policastro. I am a senior VP with Robert Half uh, here in Colorado. So I'm going to share my screen quick. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to talk this morning um, about current trends in the labor market and some of the challenges that many of you as employers and also employees could be facing um, here in 2021. We'll provide some insights into current trends and maybe some innovative ideas to help you navigate through this current labor market and certainly through these challenging times. Just to start, you know, in 2020, the, the pandemic, it turned everything upside down. Um, and many of us still in early 21, 2021 are still dealing with that. Um, before the outbreak, the unemployment rate on a national level was near a historic low of 3.5%. And then literally overnight, May of 2020, it was three times higher at 13.3%. That's crazy to think about. Literally overnight, we went from 3.5 to 13.3%. But the good news is things are looking up. And the unemployment rate now, March of 2021, is at 6.0% nationally. And I will say for Northern Colorado, even lower, 5.9%. So that's good news. We're seeing improvement. Um, and even more good news, opportunities, job opportunities based on um, the job openings and labor turn turnover survey for February told us that there are 7.4 million job openings in the month of February. Interesting to note that the quit level for the month of February was 3.4 million. Interesting statistics. So almost half of what our, what our job openings are people are feeling pretty confident with a quit level at 3.4. Just to touch quickly on how are employers feeling and employer confidence. So employers, from the survey that we conducted over a thousand employers, employers are approaching 2021 with caution about their current workforce. Almost half, so 48%, are unsure their existing employees can take on strategic projects. While 55% say their employees may not be able to handle unexpected projects. It makes sense, right? Many of our, many of our teams are very lean post pandemic. Um, and so 55% think, gosh, could we handle something unexpected? More, on employer confidence and with regard to hiring. And now that we are um, you know, in 2021, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's almost May already. Um, again, in our survey, our employers told us 51% of leaders are planned to add new jobs. So that's exciting. 42% um, plan to restaff vacated spots or bring back if they haven't already, furloughed staff, and 43% plan to reinstate salary increases in the coming year, which is exciting. And I can tell you, um, you know, from, from our perspective at Robert Half, we're working with employees, employers every single day. That's what we do. Um, so, it, you know, it, looking at your salary um, rates for your current employees is really, really important because they're increasing, which can be a little bit hard to swallow post-pandemic. It doesn't quite make sense, 
but I'm here to tell you salaries are increasing. And so it's exciting to see that 43% of our employers are telling us we're going to look at, you know, increasing salaries in the coming year. A quick look at positions in demand um, nationally. So for finance and accounting, these are the lowest unemployment rates in that sector. So credit counselors and loan officers make sense, right? Um, budget analyst, finance and investment analyst, accountants and auditors, and financial managers rank um, among the top five lowest unemployment rates with regard to finance and accounting positions. And what do our executives in finance and accounting tell us? 42% plan on hiring, again, for new or vacated roles during the first six months of this year. 49% are hiring, again, for vacated or bringing back furloughed employees and 26% are concerned about losing top accounting and finance performers to other job opportunities in the next 12 months. So that's interesting. Um, I would venture to say that um, that should be on our finance executives' minds. The last thing you need is to lose one of your top accounting and finance professionals. Quick shifting to administrative roles. Same, if you look at our lowest unemployment rates in administrative roles, file clerks, data entry specialists, customer service managers, and administrative assistants. I will tell you that local to Colorado, um, customer service is the number one position that our clients are requesting from us in the administrative profession. Um, customer service is through the roofs. In fact, um, I would tell you as, as soon as we meet a solid experienced customer service professionals, they are snatched up very quickly by our, by our clients. So that's an interesting figure to note. When we talked to our um, administrative managers, they told us that um, they've already began hiring. 54% hired new employees remotely during the pandemic. Um, and more than one third point out that the hiring process is more rapid and less complicated. So that's interesting um, that they're finding it easier to hire. That doesn't mean it's easier to onboard or train, but they're finding it's easier to hire. And 38% state that their biggest recruiting related difficulty is getting accustomed to remote work and training and onboarding. Positions in demand for technology, um, security professionals, as you can imagine, cloud, data, information, network systems, um, data administrators and architects, help desk. Can you imagine all of us working from home? I know just me alone. Um, I couldn't have done this remotely over the past year if it wasn't for our help desk. So no surprise there. And executives are telling us that they're ready to start hiring again for new roles. 54% in fact. 73% plan to grow the number of IT contractors, both interim and project fo focused and 91% are worried about losing their top IT employees to other opportunities. Interesting data. Shifting to, you know, in, in, in our largely virtual workplaces, soft, soft skills have become more important than ever. And employee, employers are looking for professionals who have self-initiative, self-direction, to get things done without having to be told or basically initiative. They're looking for employees who are adaptable and can roll with punches, have problem solving skills. And next, and this kind of couples with a lot of the information that Andrea gave us this morning, which was awesome, but returning to the office, very similar. Um, one in three professionals that we have surveyed who are currently working from home 
tell us if they were forced to return to the office full time, they would look for a new position. That's interesting um, and kind of scary, actually, if you think about it, if you don't have a plan. Um, 26% prefer to work fully remote. 49% prefer a hybrid workforce situation, while 25% of those that we surveyed tell us they were looking for fully in office employment. Um, a return to office wish list, something to make note of. They, um, if they are going to have to return to the office, employees are looking for the ability to set preferred work hours, a personal office space, potential commuting expenses, a relaxed dress code, or maybe employer provided childcare. So those are some helpful hints for those of us who are going to be fully back in the office. Employee fatigue, in our survey, our employers tell us that the, with the new normal of, of pandemic restrictions and working from home, while they may feel they're, they have a little bit more work-life balance and flexibility, they're also telling us that they're tired of, of video conferencing calls. Um, in some cases, 40%, they feel like they're not necessarily um, prioritizing their home life over their work life. And many are finding themselves working, especially parents, working parents, working over the weekends more than they ever have, or the evenings um, to account for the time that they're having to, you know, help their children. Um, so there is a bit of employee fatigue out there that you want to be aware of. This is interesting data with regard to do I relocate or stay? Employees are now thinking, if I am going to work 100% remote, can I move to another city um, where maybe the cost of living is less expensive? 51% tell us they may consider moving to a new city. 37% um, might appreciate a change in scenery or lifestyle. And, but 75% are not interested in taking a pay cut if they relocate. Employer view points on that, 50% will allow relocation, but only temporarily. 38% will allow permanent relocation. And 11% are telling us no, relocation doesn't work. Interesting. With regard to salary adjustments, 74% um, of the employers that we surveyed tell us base salaries will be based on the location of the company, not the employee. That's interesting. Uh, 23 tell us base salaries on where the employee lives and works, and 3% are not sure how they're gonna deal with that yet. Ways to support your team during this time. Quickly, it's so important to give your team support um, especially as they're working remotely, they may feel isolated or alone. And so how can you support your team during this time? Number one, promote virtual training and learning, just like what we're doing today. Make sure that you have that going and you have that in the works for your internal staff. So important. Enhance work-life balance. Many professionals are feeling stressed as a result from working from home. Again, they're working evenings, weekends. You may not even realize this. Foster well being and mental health. Communicate with your team two to three times more often than you did in the past. Allow them to share their feelings. Number four, take interest in your employees' career goals. You may have some employees that are thinking, what is there left? I'm remote, I'm working from home. What is my career path? That's on their minds. So take interest, have conversations about their career goals. And then finally, give employees workload relief. If hiring additional staff is not, you're not able to do that and you can't, you're not at the point where you can add permanent headcount, you may consider bringing in contract or temporary professionals to provide some relief to your staff. So that, you know, again, thank you for the opportunity. That was fast and furious. Um, you know, I'm not sure, Anne, that we have time for a Q&A. You can let me know. I'm definitely open to answer any questions um, or certainly 
after um, today's session, feel free to reach out to myself or your local Fort Collins um, branch of Robert Half. With that said, Anne, I think that I am good. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, wonderful insight, and we appreciate it. Again, uh, feel free to throw some questions into the chat. Karen can, can address those there. Additionally, she shared her contact information, so please feel free to reach out. We also want to remind all of our attendees today that we'll be sharing the slideshows as well as this video after the event. So there's an opportunity for you to review and reconsider. Um, but again, powerful stuff, Karen. Thank you so much. Insight and, and knowledge is power. So we appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank move, you. Yeah, we're going to move on to another showcase. Um, certainly those in the restaurant and the customer service industry were hit hard during the pandemic. And yet many of those organizations were able to thrive and, and foster even more success with their employees. So uh, excited to showcase for you today, um, Tiffany Helton, who's the co-founder of Stuff the Burger Bar, and Val Miller is the general manager of Timnith Beer Works. They're gonna talk a little bit about their pivot with their employees during the pandemic. Hi, thank you so much for having us. I'm Tiffany with Stuffed Burger Bar, and I also co-own Lonesome Buck Brewery, and I started Online Restaurant Academy. That's my new little business. So thank you so much again. And I am so pleased to speak with Val, my friend from Timnith Beer Works. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> so I know that like kind of the big question for Val, for you and me was, you know, how did we pivot through COVID? Like, how did we get through that. And honestly, and I know you're going to speak on this here in a second, but it was such a, a crazy time. And I'm smiling now because we've like, you know, now we were in this like survival mode and now we're thriving. You're right. Uh, and it, it's an exciting time to see that energy. Uh, an important thing, um, which I know Tiffany has done this as well in her businesses, is, is making sure you've created that culture uh, that you and your staff have created that culture beforehand so that when you are faced with a challenge like that, you have built up the community within the walls, in our case, within the walls of the tap room uh, and having a staff that, that works hard to do that uh, and, and doing that all the time, focusing on building your culture, building that community, building that loyalty so that if we are faced with a challenge like a pandemic, um, then you have that base. And, and I feel like we were set up so that the staff and the community weren't going to let us fail. And you made such great choices about, I feel like as a business owner through the whole pandemic, like I think it was easier to, you know, kind of turn away from that and, you know, kind of the crawl and the whole mentality. And I felt like watching you guys and you didn't do that, you know, and you said, okay, we're going to get through this together. And I'm always going to show my best. And my staff is always going to show their best. And I feel like that's why now you are not surviving and you're thriving. And it's cool to see that, you know, and that's what we've always hoped is we're fostering this culture within our businesses that we can survive anything and that they will support us even during these hard times. So that's been amazing to see. What, what I would really encourage businesses to do, um, hopefully we don't have a pandemic like this, um, but when, when you're forced with a, uh, faced with a challenge like this, is to take a breath, um, maintain hope, and just start getting creative. Uh, we, we brought the team together and we're like, okay, this is happening. We don't know necessarily what this means or for how long, so let's, what can we do? Um, and, and so we chose, uh, as Tiffany mentioned, pivoting, um, we started online beer sales. We started deliveries. We had never done any of that. Um, when we were able to reopen the end of May, we started doing table service and, and blankets, washing blankets at night so customers were comfortable when they had to be outside. And, and just trying to be creative and share the load amongst the team, but keep that positivity because the community was struggling. Um, so if we could, could make them comfortable or, or you know, bring some light to their day, then, then that was an honor for us. But I, I would just encourage people to, to be creative and compassion, compassionate. I'd agree. You know, Val, it's funny with the, you mentioned the delivery and the, the takeout sales. 
And I, I felt like this was going this way anyway, that the industry was going more online and more convenience driven. And I think if you have not embraced online and you have not embraced any kind of delivery, you have to, because now it's too easy. Now the general consumer knows that it's easier to order something to my home and the fees really, really aren't that much. And so that has totally changed. And I would say the other thing, Val, too, is the technology piece. So I'm sure you've seen when you go to restaurants now, they either have the handhelds or the scan at the tables. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us restaurant owners were afraid to embrace that. And we thought, oh, gosh, that's going to eliminate the customer service piece and the guest experience. But really, we figured out a way to incorporate that. And I feel like that now is never going away. It's just easier. It's faster. And, and it's been embraced. So I think that that has forever changed. And, and I feel like it was going that way anyway. It's just we were forced to this way a little bit faster. Right. So, and, and not only were we forced, but the customers were forced. Yeah. And I think we were hesitant to do some things because we weren't sure how the customers would react to it or how they would embrace. Uh, and, and one thing we always joke about it is if you haven't learned to be flexible in this last year, year and a half, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So um, people were more open, I think, to, okay, what do we got to do? What do we got to do to help you and, and, you know, help this community? Yeah. Well, I think we have to wrap it up, Val. Uh, yeah. So we're going to say goodbye again. I'm Tiffany with Stuffed Burger, Lonesome Buck, and Online Restaurant Academy. I'm Val, General Manager of Timnit Beer Works. Well, thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Val and Tiffany, for your insight today. We know that Main Street has been hit hard and you had to do a lot of really creative things when it came to working with your employees. And, and we so appreciate you sharing that insight with us today. And a very special shout out to all of our Main Street businesses. Um, we're, we're continuing to fight for you and, and are on your side when it comes to returning to the workforce and, and returning to economic vitality. We're gonna transition a little bit this morning. Um, I'm thrilled that we've got a really a, a a showcase speaker for us. He was he was the hit of last year's Talent Summit in helping all of us to understand what the heck do we do during this pandemic to keep our staff safe if we were bringing them back. He's here to give us some additional insight into that, that concept of safety in your workplace and how do you bring people back into that location. Please join me in welcoming Pete Gasly, president of Total Facility Care. Thanks, Pete. Hey, good morning, Ann. It's great to be here at the Talent Summit again. It's always a, it's a great event every year. And uh, gosh, listening to Andrea and, and Karen talk, I'll, I'll reference a couple of things that they said. It, it definitely mirrors some things that we're seeing on the, the cleaning and the maintenance and the, and the safety side uh, for buildings and facilities. And um, it's, it's inspiring to hear our, our Main Street businesses, how they've adapted. Um, this this past year and even our big businesses like JVS what they're doing to to um, to adapt and and be part of um, what's going on to make their business viable and and serve all of us out here in the community. So um, if you don't know Total Facility Care, we're a commercial cleaning and building maintenance company. So we've been in the thick of the pandemic here the last uh, 14 months. We haven't been working remote. We've been out here um, in your buildings serving you every day. And uh, so we have a bit of a different perspective perhaps than um, some folks who have been remote the entire year. And uh, we'll share some slides with you. As part of that, um, what, we've, what we've seen is um, we're, we're blessed to have um, clients that, because um, I can't get into my slides here, um, we're blessed to have clients in in all walks of life here um and we'll get these slides up in just a minute sorry about that here we go all right so we have uh we have clients across all all spectrums here and hopefully this is showing well there we go okay being a little little slow um so dan is that showing in full Full mode there. All right, perfect. Um, so we've got we've got customers across all spectrums of work, from office small to large, call centers, 
medical, uh, manufacturing, we've got a little bit of everything. So we get to see a little bit of all of it. So question for you in chat, which category is your team in? Um, you've probably got some folks that are like, hey, let's do a group hug and let's get back to work, right? Let's, let's just get this thing over with. Or B, um, I've been home for a year and I'm afraid. Maybe I'm going to get sick when I come back to office. And I think Andrea and Karen both talked to a little bit of that. So where's your team at in, in all of that? So here's our, here's our current conditions. Um, we've got a lot of people getting vaccinated right now. Um, and with those who have been infected over the past year, our herd immunity is rising. And um, I believe I saw the Larimer County site today said that Larimer County is at about 53% and the public health director wants to get to 65. And I, I saw a cool graphic from the chamber yesterday that uh, we're, on that, we're on that road to 65. Um, so as of last Friday, the state dial uh, no longer is in effect. And that means every county is um, making their own decisions. So if you're in Boulder County, um, you're, you're locked up with six other counties, including Denver, and you're gonna, you're gonna follow what they're doing. And they've been a bit more proscriptive and restrictive um, throughout the pandemic. If you're in Larimer County, um, we're at blue on the old dial. Offices can be back at 75% capacity. And the intention right now from public health is that by mid-May, um, all restrictions can be released. So we'll see how that comes. If you're um, on the other side of I-25 in Weld County, there's no restrictions currently except those that are uh, prescribed by a business or by the local municipality, and they can be more restrictive than the county. So um, we've seen some great stuff from Andrea and from Karen on return to work. And I want you to know it can be done well and um, assure your team that it's gonna be safe to be in the facility. And I think both of our previous speakers talked about communicate um, and it's really key in all of this as we go forward. So what about the regulatory environment around this? Um, pandemic is really new. Um, OSHA was created in 1970, so we haven't had a pandemic since they've been around. Um, and most of us haven't had a pandemic in our lifetimes. Um, I don't think there's many folks working that were here in 1918. Um, so um, they, they've done a couple of things. And the first thing to note is that they are preparing, OSHA is preparing an emergency national rule um, and it's going to closer resemble what Virginia has done. Um, and they adopted their ruling in January. So um, to, to take some pressure off, most of the elements that are in this proposed rule mirror what's really become standard practices. So um, social distancing in the business, um, plexiglass, plexiglass uh, partitions um, to protect workers from uh, the public, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, um, increased cleaning, those kinds of things. Um, one of the interesting things in the proposed uh, rule though is paid time off for COVID vaccination. So um, that could be something that we may get to navigate um, going forward. And we're expecting that this emergency national rule will be published in May, perhaps as late as June. Um, and then the second thing to note is that um, OSHA last year about this time um, said that COVID would fall under the general duty clause and that they would be, um, they would have a lot of uh, flexibility in interpretation around it um, because there was so much community transmission. How would we know exactly if it, if it happened at work or if it happened because of community transmission? But there have been some areas that they've been um, aggressive in enforcing. And the first one is not having a respirator program. So if you're requiring workers to have an N95 or KN95 mask, um, those are the high filtration. And the 95 means that it filters out 95% of the air particles. Um, you have to have a respirator program. As an employer, you have to have one. Now, if you choose to wear one of those as an individual, that's fine. But as an employer, you have to have a respirator program. Um, and then the second area um, that has caught empl employers up is not reporting work COVID cases on their 300 log as a work-related illness. And they've been cited um, for the log violation on that. So um, if you're not sure, it would be good to um, reach out to maybe your 
uh, workers comp or your um, general liability insurer and they can one of their experts can maybe help you navigate that or your employer um, uh, employment law firm and I know we got David Swissler coming up here later um, and they can help guide you as to whether that up whether that applies and, and give you some good guidance on that and then just realize that the general duty clause is really taking appropriate precautions um, at a right level um, with your team and if you're doing if you're doing the right thing you, most of the time you're going to be um, in compliance so survey says we've heard some interesting numbers and uh, here's here's some that will reinforce it and maybe and maybe they intersect a bit but um, 60 percent of respondents said they'd take a lower paying job um, if they could be in a healthier working environment than where they are currently and some of that as we look i think at hey you're going to make me be back in the office all the time that may that's part of that consideration um, and 35 percent have said they they're already finding a new job with better hygiene practices so the safety that you um, have in your office and the perception of that safety is going to be important as we return to work. Um, and 70% of it, uh, employees say that as they look for work, they're going to ask about health and hygiene policies. So be prepared to answer what you're doing. Um, and I thought this was interesting. Top, top expectations, clean indoor air, 62% of respondents, efficient air circulation, regular disinfection and natural lighting. So natural lighting, think about windows and daylighting coming in, clean indoor air, uh, the filtration and what you're doing about that um, in, the, in the office and then regular disinfecting. So um, again, I think Andrew talked about it and Karen too, communicate um, a lot and we'll talk about this here next. So how do you make it, how do you make it great? I think the first thing is know the condition of your team it's probably a spectrum. You've got some people that are just chomping at the bit. They want to be in the office. They want to, they want to give everyone a group hug, literally, and uh, they want to come in. You've got other folks that are, are really terrified. They've, they've literally not left their house hardly ever. Um, they're having food delivered. They're, they're having services come into their home. Um, they just, they've been working from home. They've been schooling from home. Um, so you've got folks across the spectrum, and we've seen that in the surveys. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of 30%, 50%, um, and, and probably 20% on that top end of where they're at. So we heard the speakers earlier talk about communicate, 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 and we're, we're a big fan of um, EOS. And in that it says you have, to, you have to tell folks at least seven times before the, the message resonates. So as leaders, we get tired of talking about this stuff, but in our organization, we, we really attempted to over communicate last year. And for this year, we put together a communication plan. So we've got senior leadership talking to our team every two weeks um, on a calendar throughout this year. And a lot of it is what, what we're, um, what's been said already. Hey, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but here's what we're thinking. And here's, here's some options that we're evaluating. And we've gotten tremendous feedback from our team that they just, they appreciate it. They feel cared for in that, and they um, and they feel like they're in the loop versus being in the dark. So it's it's really been helpful. So I'd encourage you, even if you don't know completely what your plan is, that hey, we're working on it. We'd love some feedback, um, and here's what we're doing, and then take real steps based on your building and your team to make it safe. Um, some of our customers are creating return to work welcome kits. Um, They've got simple things in there like hand sanitizer and a logo or a mask with the company's logo on it. Um, some self cleaning supplies for workspaces, um, those kinds of things. And you can, you can get creative with this, obviously. Um, tell your team how you're cleaning and how you've upgraded your air filtration if you have. Um, and that maybe you've placed barriers from the public and you've created more spacing. I thought it was interesting that Karen said that more um, employees are wanting individual offices. So are th there's some things you can do with your furniture to create that individual space, but tell them how you're doing it um, and take credit for maybe the things that have been kind of behind the scenes and quiet. Um, and then the third idea is really um, have visible cleaning during working hours. It's, it's interesting. 
Um, we've seen a number of customers implement this and typically um, what they've implemented is <coughs> kind of lunchtime cleaning, maybe between 10 and two where common areas are spiffed up. The kitchen is spiffed up. The restrooms are spiffed up, but more than anything, um, we've heard great feedback on it. It just feels good to have somebody in here doing stuff because in our business, most of the, most of the cleaning happens after hours, out of sight, out of mind. Um, you come in and hopefully it looks great every morning. Um, but that reassurance that, gosh, my employer really cares about us and we're doing something, doing something about that. Um, plan your phased approach. So um, Andrew talked about this, give them lots of notice of when they're coming back. Um, best practices we've seen out there are 30 days or longer. Um, we've got folks planning right now for June 1st or July 1st, um, return to work and tell them what you're doing um, and then do it and then tell them that you did it. And again, you may not have your plan fully fleshed out yet, but tell them these are the things that we're evaluating and what we're doing as part of our plan. And then let them see you actually doing those things and then communicate afterwards that, hey, we're doing it. Um, and remember, we told you we we're going to do these things or, hey, we learned some things and we're changing a bit. Um, and then the third idea is publish your administrative controls. And administrative controls are things like, hey, we're going to do a health check with everybody when they come in every day. And that can be a questionnaire. It could be a temperature check. Um, any of those kinds of things qualify. Um, we're going to reduce this, the um, capacity in our conference rooms. Um, maybe we had 12 people in there now before pandemic, and now we're going to limit it to four just for spacing and safety. We're going to require masks when two or more people are together in a room meeting together. Um, those all would be examples of administrative controls that you're taking. And then consider um, a percentage of your team at a time returning until you can kind of get that full return. And I really love that concept that Andrea said of the moments that matter. When do you have to have people there? Um, but we've got clients that they've got a red team or a blue team or an A team or a B team. And they're um, only the essential workers on those teams have been in the buildings, um, but they're, everybody's on one of those teams. So they're gonna bring them back at a greater percentage um, and, and phase that in. And then um, we've already heard it many times this morning, partial permanent remote work um, is, is a great idea going forward. So some best practices, uh, visual, visible signs of cleaning. If you, can, if you can work with your vendor to get a gleam clean, we call it, or a comfort clean that, hey, the place is sparkling and it looks good. Um, midday visible clean, that can be from your vendor or it could be volunteers. Hey, we've got a, um, we're all taking a turn at this and, and here's whose day it is, right? Um, Self-cleaning supply stations for either their workspaces or um, in common areas, um, conference rooms and kitchens and those kinds of things, hand sanitizer dispensers, daily health checks, um, signs as reminders. Um, I think signs by your thermostat on what you did about the air handling. Um, it's one of those invisible things and to have that high filtration and that it, that's changing out and then elevator spacing um, inside the elevator. Okay, so we've come back and now COVID strikes, or more likely people may just get sick that have been home. It's kind of like going back to school at the beginning of the year, right? So we haven't been around a lot of people and now we're with each other. Um, due to the herd immunity, um, we're probably not gonna get COVID, but colds and flus and all those things are still out there. So people are gonna get sick. So think about that. Again, that's part of your administrative um, controls. So someone has COVID, we've come back. Oh no, now what do we do? We gotta close down and send everybody home. Gosh, am I gonna get sick? Um, how do I have to quarantine? So the answers to those are, do I have to quarantine 10 days? Well, maybe. Um, do I have to close the building? Hopefully not. And am I going to get sick? Maybe, but probably not. So here's what we say, assess, assess, assess. Um, we wanna, um, you may want to decontaminate or deep clean or just a comfort clean based on the viral load and exposure. And that's really the assessment that we do with you is um, how long, when were they there? How long has it been since they've been in the building? And it may take some special equipment and trained staff to decontaminate for you, or it may not depending on the viral load factors. 
and then communicate to your staff and your critical vendors what's going on. Hey, we've had somebody with COVID and here's what we're doing about it. Um, transparency is critical and you're like, oh, everybody's gonna get freaked out. If you tell them what you're, what's happened and what you're doing, it's gonna give them security and hey, we're not trying to hide any, anybody. And again, if you're not sure, um, call, we're glad to consult with you on it and uh, we can give you some guidance and help um, all the time. So um, I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions, Anne. Um, really to open it up to the group, what concerns you most about returning to work in terms of safety? And, uh, and maybe if you wanna, hey, my team's here on the spe spectrum, are there any other specifics? I'd be glad to share that as well. So Anne, I'll turn it over to you and for, and for questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pete. Once again, um, such powerful on the ground data that we can use as employers to, to do things right when we're bringing people back and, and keeping them in the building. Um, one question that has come up through the, the chat was, um, where do you go for your best information relative to OSHA and, and those guidance? Uh, sure. Well, I get, I get several updates from our industry. Um, and I just go right to OSHA's website. That's the best place to see what's going on. And that would be true as well for um, other guidance. I go directly to the CDC's website for the most up-to-date information. And, they're, and they've got new information coming out all the time. So, and I and I'm, have a lot of industry publications that we monitor as well um, with other, you know, studies from places like John Hopkins and UCLA and those places that are really on the front of epidemiology. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm, I'm also very fascinated with this transition that we're making because of COVID um, to visible cleaning, right? I, 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 right. I would suggest that previously all of your work was in the middle of the night. Nobody wanted to see that. We just wanted to know when we came in in the morning, everything was fresh. Talk a little bit more about that psychology as well as the importance of that cleaning throughout the day to create a safe space. Yeah, you bet. You know, uh, daytime cleaning has actually been around probably 15 years or longer. And it really started with the sustainability movement. Hey, what if we could move these folks into the daytime and we could save on lighting and energy and those kinds of things. And so um, we've been doing that in some areas for quite a while. And if you go to a full daytime cleaning mode, what that really looks like is staff is going to start at five or six of the morning and do loud things like vacuuming early. And then they'll be cleaning other areas during the day. And it's been great for our team because um, people see them and they're appreciated. And it's been great for the customers because again, they feel like, ah, we're being being cared for. Um, most of our customers this last year that have gone to that visible daytime cleaning, we're still doing the bulk of the deep cleaning and the hard stuff at night, but we're there in the daytime doing um, some touch-up cleaning and disinfecting again in common areas. And it's given people a lot of comfort, um, particularly in the pandemic. And I think the other part of that is just having visible cleaning supplies available in, in your office or your workspace so folks can clean up. Um, particularly in common areas after they've been together. Um, so we've got a, another question that came through the chat. Um, it's asking, if you're a tenant um, in a building, what's reasonable to ask for the owner relative to air filtration? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So one of the buildings that we take care of, uh, well, number one, I'd ask them what they're doing. <laughs> And maybe they're already, um, they've already upgraded that and they're on top of it. Um, I can tell you for a building that, that we do the maintenance on, um, we upgraded the air filtration to MERV 13, which is um, filters out viruses and all of those kinds of things. It's about a 40,000 square foot building and it cost $800 for the year. So it was really inexpensive and it was a no brainer for them to add that. Fantastic. Any, any other closing thoughts you'd like to throw out the group, Pete, as far as those things you absolutely must do or those things that are more on the fringe? Um, sure. I, I, I think more it's uh, philosophy than anything. I think people are hungry to get back together and be in community, um, but they want to do it safely. And so I think the thing for all of us is people are at different places. So let's honor where they are. 
If, um, if a business wants mask wearing all the time, great, let's honor that. And then let's just have grace <laughs> with each other um, as we're working through this, because we've got people um, all across the spectrum there. And uh, we just need to have some grace and honor each other as we come back to work. Outstanding. Thank you again, Pete, for your time, for your insight. We want to remind our attendees, we'll have Pete's slides available on our event website after, as well as the video from today will also be available. So um, make sure to check it out. And uh, hopefully we can change our topic next year, Pete, and we won't be so worried about um, cleaning. We, we can dive into other interesting things with you next year. I agree. That would be fantastic. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Well, we're going to keep charging ahead here today. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I do want to remind you, we've got a poll that is live on the event website. And so the chat, the Q&A, and the poll are all on the right-hand side of your screen. You can click there and share your insights relative to the polling questions we have up and live right now, as well as a place for you to add into the chat or ask some questions of our speakers today. Our next speaker... Uh, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to have join us. Um, he is going to talk about the future of workforce and um, the insights that we're about to get, I, I believe are incredibly powerful. They're coming from Jim Nottingham, who is with HP Inc. Um, he's the global head uh, and general manager of advanced commute computer <laughs> computer solutions. Sorry about that, Jim. Uh, he's going to get ready to share with us what HP believes the future of workforce. Please welcome Jim Nottingham. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to talking with you. Uh, first, you know, I want to say that both Andrea uh, uh, and Pete did a great job. A lot of what I'm going to talk about, Andrea did a great job of covering. And, uh, you know, a lot of what Pete's talking about is also critically important, particularly in the transition, you know, from where we are today to actually getting to this hybrid workforce uh, of the future. There, there's a big transition as we re-enter. So I think both of those were, were very well done. And uh, I'm going to give you really more of a working example here in Fort Collins of, of HP and, and how this future of work and what hybrid work means for us and, and really why it's important. Uh, really touching on a lot of the points that they made. Let me, let me go ahead and share my slides here. And let me know if you can see that in full screen mode. Okay. So talking about the future of workforce at HP, and really I'm gonna focus on Fort Collins. So just as a, as a refresher, a lot of people are familiar with HP. Uh, we've been in Colorado for a long time, um, since you know, 1959. The Fort Collins site opened in 1976. And recently, one thing, it's, it's actually been a point of, a little bit of a point of confusion is HP split. You know, HP was a, a very large company in 2015. We split into what is Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which was all of our enterprise services, networking, storage business, and our uh, what we what my business is today, HP Inc. So um, a lot of people talk about Hewlett Packard Enterprise; they refer to them as HPE, and so we get a lot of confusion between, um, you know, are you when we say HP, because we're all from the same family, it's like, hey, are you HPE or are you HP Inc? So I'm talking about HP Inc. And we are the, the, the business, the HP that, that, that delivers uh, print and PCs, including high-end PCs. We also do 3D print and we have some, you know, some new businesses and, and uh, that, that we're uh, entering into when it comes to microfluidics and some other exciting things. So here on Fort Collins, we actually have most businesses of HP Inc. or business functions are represented on site um, here in Fort Collins. It's across customer support. Uh, our uh, CTO office has people here. We have, of course, the, the legal affairs, HR. We've got people from HP Labs here. Um, uh, a large group from our personal systems. Personal systems is our PC group. Uh, we've got a larger group from um, 
our personal system software team. They do a lot of work with my business. Um, uh, so does the supply chain and operations team. We have a, also a large uh, um, group there as well as customer support. They all support um, and, and work across businesses across HP. They also help my business, which is also based out of Fort Collins, which is the advanced compute and solutions business. That includes uh, workstations and VR, which is really comes out of Fort Collins. Workstations are just really the high-end, high-performance PCs. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot about our business and, and why it's, it's kind of right in the middle of this, this hybrid work and why it's a super important topic for us and, and the future of, of our work. So anytime we talk about workstations or we talk about advanced compute, we have to start with our customers. Everything we do is really to create value for some, a pretty amazing group of customers. And I mean, our, uh, I, could, I could literally uh, spend a long time walking through a long list of very recognizable big names from NASA to DreamWorks to Tesla. You know, they love our products. Um, they love our brand. And our, our workstation brand is the Z by HP brand. They love that brand because they know uh, and they trust that our teams here in Fort Collins really understand the technology. And even more importantly, we understand their work. We understand what they do. Because while we do deliver and create great technology, um, we couldn't equip these uh, customers with the equipment they need to go create, you know, world-changing things. And, and honestly, my business is, is very inspiring because these customers are the change makers. They're the game changers. They're the, the artists that are creating dreams for kids. They're the, the, the scientists that are putting people into space. There are people that are uh, diagnosing and, and, and helping people with COVID and also, you know, doing the, the, the incredibly complicated work of uh, creating vaccines in, you know, a short amount of time. So all of our customers are really the world's uh, change makers. They push boundaries and they're the ones that change the way we live, the way we work, and, and really the way we play. They change, they change all aspects of, of life. So um, I'm going to go just because I think a video is worth, you know, a million words <laughs> in my case, I'm going to uh, play a video really quickly just to give you an idea of the customers that I'm talking about and how they use our solutions to equip them. Uh, for their for their breakthroughs. After decades of relentless innovation, we've entered a new era of high performance technology, the era of Z. We're equipping you to evolve, to change for the better, faster. We deliver transformative power so you can advance in AI and 3D, reimagine collaboration, Render in real time and make magic happen behind the scenes with Z Central, a remote collaboration software that just won us an engineering Emmy. How do we do it? With a rich portfolio of IP and patents that shatters industry standards again and again. An unwavering commitment to sustainability and security. And by teaming up with NVIDIA to deliver the high compute power you need to propel your next breakthrough. We are redefining the future of design. This is Z by HP. Okay, great. Yeah, hopefully you can see uh, that our customers do pretty amazing things and they count on us to, to provide them the technology and the equipment to go do that. And obviously they need, you know, they do count on us to deliver very high performance, very high reliability, high security. They count on all that but these customers need so much more than specs. So when we talk about um, you know, the customers, what is common across all of these creators, all of these power users, uh, game changers, and what defines them really is they all use tools that are super complex, high, comp high computational complexity. They use workflows, which is the, all the tools and all the infrastructure they use, very complex. So when we talk about them working from home, 
it becomes a, a much more difficult task because, you know, a lot of these uh, workers can't, you know, box up uh, their racks of workstations and advanced tools and certainly the IP, the, 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 the data, they just can't take it home. And, and a lot of them can't, you know, just take their work home on a laptop. So we've had a lot of unique challenges. And I think, um, I think Andrea covered it uh, exactly uh, correctly. As we understand uh, how to deliver, you know, how to help these customers become more productive, we've got to understand the work they do, the jobs to be done. And we've got to understand how can they do all these complex tasks from working from home. We have created some technologies to do that. We agree fully the future is going to be hybrid work. There's going to be people that have to be in the office. My team's in Fort Collins. They work a lot with equipment, chemicals, materials, prototypes. There are several people that, um, that, that have had to be in the office, you know, throughout the pandemic. And, and so we've had to take, you know, a lot of special measures, uh, like what Pete talked about, to make it safe for them. And over time, there's going to be more and more that really um, need at least partial access to the office. So this, this hybrid mode is going to be very, very real. And even for people that can work from home, and I think uh, uh, Andrea mentioned this, there, there's a thing about relationships that really matters, and we are working on a trust bank. So our focus is really, really twofold. How do we become highly effective? It's outcome-based. People will want to go to the office and, and need to go to the office to really create the outcomes that we need. So some of that, sometimes uh, people might need to go into the office just to collaborate. And they're going to they're gonna go to the office not because they feel like they have to, but because they want to, because they're going to get that relationship, kind of those sparks of magic that are required to, to innovate, to think, you know, to think of these new ideas or to, to brainstorm new ideas. That requires people to get together. Me personally, I recently uh, was in Taiwan. I spent the month of January in Taiwan um, after a year you know, being away, I, I had to do the quarantine thing and it was worth it because we had some very important meetings. And just as an example of the relationship, I would say what, just one dinner with one of our very important partners in Taiwan, we probably made more progress than you can make in a hundred Zoom meetings, just by having the, the, the interaction, being able to read each other, look each other in the eyes. It was just a good reminder of how important relationships are. That's, that's true with customers, it's true with partners, and absolutely it's true with our employees. And so what we want to, um, to really focus on, how do we continue to increase productivity and um, how do we take advantage of everything we've learned during this massive experiment so that we can put the virtual and the face-to-face -to -face together in a way that actually makes it better than it was before the pandemic. Now, between now and then, we got a lot of stuff to figure out and do, but, but I'm actually very optimistic that our best days haven't happened yet. I think that we've got a lot of, of new innovations and new capabilities uh, and new ways of working that are gonna enable us to do new things. That leads me to my second point. Um, which is the one thing we've done really well during the pandemic is we've made it easy to work uh, anytime uh, around kids' schedules, uh, whenever our colleagues around the world are working. But by making it easy to work anytime, we've also made it easy to work all the time. And, and it's actually a real issue, you know, with, with workloads and such. So we, we see this this move to hybrid and how to make it better and improve productivity for our customers, uh, not really a call to action. We see it as a call for innovation. There are big opportunities for us here in Fort Collins at HP and at all of our, all the other companies around the world that are enabling uh, workers to work in this hybrid model and um, to continue to provide the services and goods that, that we expect there are just so many opportunities to make that better um, in terms of how people work when they are working remote or when they are together or when they're a combination of the two. So that's our focus uh, within our business. The, 
you know, the hybrid model that that Andrea talked about, we're, we're very much aligned with that. We're very, we see very consistent things across all of our customers and with our employees. And getting back to what Pete said, you know, as we transition to this hybrid model, um, which again, I believe can be better than it was, there's gonna be a big transition because when you have people working remotely and people in the office that are wearing masks, socially distanced, a Zoom meeting becomes a lot less effective than having everybody's faces you know, on the screen. That's just one example. And there's many uh, logistical challenges, audio, video challenges, and opportunities that we see to make all of that better. So that's our focus. And in the, you know, in the steady state, we believe for sure the home office is going to be uh, an integral part of how our employees work. Absolutely, the HP office will be for those whose work has to be in the office. And to uh, Andrea's point, the flexibility, creating flexible uh, work hours, which we've always really tried to have at HP. It's actually a benefit, I believe, of working at HP is we've got a lot of flexibility. Continuing to that flexibility and adaptability to change what flexibility means as we learn more. The same with the home. And then how do we, um, how do we marry those in the office and virtual environments in a way that makes us more productive and uh, more, uh, more collaborative uh, when it comes to doing some of the complex things that we have to do. So that's our focus. There will also be uh, opportunities in the future for more of these co-working spaces, collaboration spaces only, particularly in areas where we don't have, um, you know, big sites or big offices. And lastly, it, it's a whole nother topic by itself, but I would say it's important for Fort Collins, it's important for us. Recruiting has changed dramatically for the better with the pandemic. One, because a lot of uh, people have been leaving the, the big metro areas they're moving to places like Colorado and you know, I, Idaho, Montana, they're, they're moving here. So, so the, the talent that we have um, is a much larger pool and it is easier to work remote. So now we can recruit and have people remote even if they're only traveling occasionally to get together with their teams. So with that, I'll pause. Uh, and if, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, or if anybody else has any questions, let me hop out of the. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. It was um, so exciting to have that refresher of what what's going on on Harmony Road? Who, who is over there? So that was amazing. But as well, your insights are, are incredibly valuable and powerful for all of us as we as we navigate this space. And there's no doubt that HP has long been um, a key leader when it comes to remote work, hybrid work, as well as creating solutions that help all of us work better wherever we're at. So thank you so much, Jim. We look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So if you're anything like me, um, you've just been trying to keep the office open every day for the last year and um, didn't really pay attention to what exactly might have changed when it comes to HR policy or new laws, new labor laws. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm the bearer of bad news. A lot has changed. If you haven't, if you haven't kept up, this is that moment to sound that wake up bell. And we are so pleased to have with us David Zwizzler with Ogletree Deacons Nash, Smote and Stewart PC to give us an update on changes to the labor laws and especially those things that you need to pay attention to as an employer of choice. Welcome, David. Thanks, Ann. Um, let me see if I can master the technology and actually share my screen. Hold on just a second. Hopefully you can see the screen. So, you know, I think it goes without saying 2020 was transformational and what a great amount of content my predecessors have given a really good uh, set of presentations. So kudos to the chamber. Um, with regard to employment law, it's been equally transformational. 
I'm going to go a little fast here just to try to touch on some of the highlights or lowlights, depending on kind of which chair you sit in on some of the more impactful legislation that we've seen in Colorado. But just to back up a little, obviously 2020, we saw the Fed step in and pass the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which had multiple facets, but the one that I'll focus on was a paid sick leave requirement, which was the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, not to be outdone, Colorado passed its own sets of legislation, first stepped in with the Colorado Health Order, which provided some mandated COVID-related paid time off. Um, and then our local legislators stepped in and passed the Colorado Healthy Families and Workplaces Act. Now there were three opponents to the HFWA and one related to paid time off in 2020. And I won't spend any time on that since we've now gone beyond it. And then there are two separate components that I think need to be highlighted. One under the HFWA, there is a requirement for paid sick leave and two, there's also a component related to pandemic leave. So with a little bit more detail, let's start with the paid sick leave obligation. In Colorado, as of 2021, all Colorado employers or virtually all Colorado employers with 16 or more employees are required to provide paid sick leave. Now I identify that 16 employee threshold, understanding that in 2022, it's all employers. So I just want to note for this year, there's a threshold for next year, there's not. But what that obligation is, is Colorado employers are required to provide to their employees paid sick leave at an accrual rate of one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours of work provided by the employee up to 48 hours of paid sick leave. Now, obviously the state says you can have a more generous accrual or not limit the cap at 48, but those are the minimal standards. And what that paid sick leave is intended to be for is leave for your employees or their family members if they have mental or a physical illness for which they're seeking care, treatment, um, or if they're restricted from work. So if your employee's sick or their family member sick and your employee can't come to work, then employees in Colorado now have available to them paid time off. That paid time off is also intended to cover um, the employee or the employee's family members need for leave related to domestic abuse, sexual assault, or other forms of harassment unrelated to the workplace. So if they're seeking services or relocation assistance because they've been a victim of that kind of trauma outside of the workplace, paid sick leave can be used for that. Or during a public health emergency, such as COVID, if the government shuts down the company or if the government shuts down a local school and your employees need time off to care for their children, paid sick leave can be used for that. Um, Notably that if the leave is foreseeable, your employees are expected to give you some kind of notice of when the leave is needed and for how long it might be needed. Um, obviously though, with much of paid sick leave, it, you get sick one night and you can't come to work the next day. So there's not a real opportunity for foreseeable notice to the employer. Um, also, if it is foreseeable, the employee is expected to kind of work with the employer so that whatever leave they need it doesn't disrupt the workplace. Um, many employers have historically had kind of a, a standard of if you're out for three consecutive days, then we're going to require you to provide a doctor's note. The Healthy Families and Workplace Act says you can't ask for that kind of documentation until there's been four consecutive days. And included with permissible documentation is a written note from the employee explaining why they were out. So. You don't even have to necessarily go to the doctor and get a note, their written affirmation that this is why I was out and it's for a covered leave is sufficient. Um, the law also allows for a carryover of up to 48 hours into the next year of those paid sick leave hours. But the law also says you can limit an employee to only using 48 hours, even if they've accrued more. Um, paid sick leave is not required to be paid out, just so you know, so if it's an additional benefit you've never provided, it's not something you need to pay out upon separation. Um, and if you have a paid time off policy that essentially provides for the minimum number of hours, so at least that 48 hour threshold, 
that can be used for the purposes that I've identified in one hour increments or smaller, you can take credit for your PTO system and not have to add on top of that an additional set of paid sick leave obligations. The second component of the HFWA is also a pandemic leave requirement. And what that basically says was as of January 1st, if your employees didn't already have up to 80 hours of paid sick leave available, you are obligated to supplement whatever they had and get them to 80. So if your employees had zero hours of paid sick leave, you are obligated to make available to them 80 hours for COVID related purposes. If your employees had 40 hours, you're obligated to provide an additional 40 to supplement up to 80. If your employees had 120, no additional supplementation was required. So that's the HFWA in a nutshell, a paid sick leave obligation and a paid public health emergency leave obligation. And I also then wanna move on to the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act, which was passed actually in 2019. There were two components of this law. One was fairly basic. You're not allowed to pay women less than men. I don't know that that was very earth shattering, but the law also then kind of set out some parameters about their only permissible differences when you've got a viable seniority system or a merit system, or you can measure quantity or quality, um, or if there's differences in where somebody lives. So maybe Pueblo is different than Fort Collins. So there are some standards that you need to assess against on if whether it's acceptable to have pay differentials for men and women under a variety of circumstances. It also notably prohibits employers from seeking the wage history of their employees or applicants or using those employees wage histories as a reason for how they move forward within your organization financially. So that was the initial component of the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. The second component, which is a transparency obligation kicked in in January of 2021. And this really was kind of an intent to make your Colorado workers more aware of the positions that you're filling and the wages that you're providing. So I wanna kind of make that a little bit more concrete, which basically means, let's just say you are a Colorado employer only. If you have Colorado employees, anytime that you are hiring into a position or promoting within the organization, you have to let your current employees know the title of that position, how they might apply for that position and the wages or wage range for the position any components related to wages such as commissions or bonuses and other general information about benefits such as paid time off or health care. Um, every time you're hiring, every time you're promoting, you're supposed to give your Colorado employees advance notice of that decision. Um, if you are Colorado Plus, so let's say you have workers outside of Colorado, anytime that you're promoting, let's say you've got an office in Kansas City or in Cheyenne, if your promoter or hiring into those offices, you're supposed to give your Colorado employees notice prior to making those decisions of the opening or opportunity. Um, if you are Colorado Plus, so you've got workers outside, you're not obligated to necessarily share the wage information or benefits information for those positions that are being filled outside of Colorado. If you are posting for a position that could be filled in Colorado, so let's say you're posting nationally for a Colorado position, those postings are required to have the wage benefit, the wage information, the compensation information, and the benefit information in the posting. So you're obligated to make that more public to any potential applicants. One nuance, of course, is what if you don't really care where the work is done? So let's say you're a tech company and you are hiring wherever. If that job could be done in Colorado, you're obligated to tell all of the workforce that you're seeking what those wages are, what other factors might affect compensation and what the benefits are. So some nuanced application of what you need to tell your employees, what you need to include in a post, but the effort here really is to make basically all jobs that are done in Colorado much more transparent, not only to your employees, but to your um, potential applicants who are seeking work in Colorado. Like I said, lots of nuances there, hard to fit this into a 10 minute little bit of a presentation. One thing I do want to just kind of highlight on the local level that's currently be considered by our state legislator, there's an act called the Protecting Opportunities and Workers' Rights Act. This law, if you haven't heard of it, you should probably look it up because it significantly rewrites our anti-discrimination statutes. And I'll highlight just the biggest part of it. Right now, the current standard for an employer to be liable is that 
the harassment has to be so severe or pervasive such that it alters a term and condition of employment. This new power act changes that dramatically and basically says that anytime conduct offends, humiliates, distresses, or intrudes upon the individual or otherwise interferes with and undermines the individual's personal sense of well-being or safety, that's sufficient for an employer to be liable. So if this law is passed, the bar goes from severe pervasive to basically you hurt somebody's feelings or they felt unsafe. Um, with that, I think I'm going to run out of time. Happy to answer questions, whether it's in the chat or offline. My contact information is available and um, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, David. Uh, a lot, as you said, to, to shrink into 10 minutes. We appreciate the quick snapshot. Um, and, and if you heard nothing else today, it's that you need to start paying attention. And we encourage people to, to reach out to experts like David, uh, others that are in your community to make sure that you're understanding the new laws and that, that you're meeting them but as well, you're providing that protection for your employees. So thanks so much, David. We appreciate it. Thank you. So we are almost at time for our event today. Uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, hopefully you walked away with some information that can be valuable to you. We want to remind you that the Chamber is heavily invested in creating talent for the future of Northern Colorado, but we don't do that work alone. We are joined by the Loveland Chamber of Commerce, the City of Fort Collins, the City of Loveland, Larimer County, Weld County, the Larimer County Economic and Workforce Development Office, the Employment Services of Weld County, United Way of Larimer County, the City of Greeley, and the Greeley Area Chamber of Commerce. We couldn't do it without we couldn't do this work without their support and, and their help. If you're looking for some great resources, we encourage you to visit workinnortherncolorado.com. That's our talent portal that we've been able with our partners to prop up and, and make as a resource for you as employers. But as well, it tells the story of Northern Colorado and the jobs that are available. We, we are working hard to make sure that lots of people are seeing this site and, and are connecting with you as employers, again, bringing that talent to Northern Colorado. To finalize our conversation today, I'm gonna to do a special shout out to our, our goal, to all of our sponsors again. You've seen them rotating up above my head or, or above our speakers' heads, but we want to do a very special thank you to these sponsors. Uh, our gold sponsors, the City of Fort Collins and HPE Inc. Our silver sponsors, BizWest Media and Columbine Health Systems. Our bronze sponsors, Elevations Credit Union, Madwire, Northern Engineering, Robert Half, and UC Health. And then our event sponsors, Canvas Credit Union, North 40 News and Sinorama. We appreciate you joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Of course, I can't sign off without offering a couple of challenges to you. So I wanna encourage you that if you enjoyed today's session, tweet about it, post about it, use that hashtag, work in Northern Colorado. And um, we always want to encourage you to be a proud, loud advocate for business success. We've made it through this um, incredibly challenging time, but we've got even more lifting to do. Help tell your story, help make sure that you inspire community and go out and make it a great day. Ooh.